right into the book of Jonah. Jonah is an interesting word. It, it means in the Hebrew tongue, dove. And the dove is chosen because it, it's, it's a bird that the very coup itself is a coup of love, peace, understanding. And the, the prime of the name, the etymology of the very name itself <clears throat> even comes from yayin, which is wine in the Hebrew tongue, because of the warmth that that dove brings and just hearing it. You know, I, I'm blessed that I have hundreds of doves that come to my feeders every day, uh, along with many other birds, but uh, they're, they're fantastic and always connected with the Holy Spirit. And this is why God would use this Jonah and would use him as he has. And, um, you know, you might wonder, well, what has this to do with us? Well, do you understand when Christ walked the earth, I'm going to read to you from Matthew chapter 12, verse 39. Listen carefully. And you'll see how important this book of Jonah is. Verse 39 of Matthew chapter 12, and it reads, But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. And there shall no sign be given to it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas, and Jonas is the Greek form of Jonah. Okay, so that's all you're going to get, Christ is saying. Well, what does that mean? Well, you begin to see the importance of it. Okay, verse 40, for as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. He's going to be in the grave three days and three nights. Verse 41, the men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonas and behold, a greater than Jonas is here. In other words, Christ was standing before them. He that would be three days in the tomb, three nights in the tomb. He that was the son of God he that was the living word became flesh and was walking among them. So this book of Jonas becomes a very important book. It's a sign you're going to receive. And it's a sign that you really need. You know, many people think that Jonah was a coward. Jonah was a student of God's word. Jonah knew that Nineveh, which is the capital of Assyria, would be taking the ten tribes into captivity, his own people. Therefore, he was willing to sacrifice himself so that the Assyrian could not find salvation or the blessings of God to overtake or to conquer or to take his people captive. This is why Jonah would run. This is why Jonah would disobey God for out of the love of his people. Chapter 1, the great book of Jonah, and uh, verse 1. Let's get right into it. We won't get very far today, but let's start it. Now the word of the Lord, well, now what was this? The word of the Lord, not Jonah's word. The word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittah, saying, this is, this Amittah is the prophet, truth of Yah, okay? Can't get any better than that. Verse 2, arise and go to Nineveh that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. Now, again, Jonah knows, hey, these are the people that are going to conquer my people. It is written, verse 3, but Jonah rose up to flee into Tarshish from the presence of the Lord, and he went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish 
for, from the presence of the Lord. If you receive any one thing from this sign of Jonas, if God has a duty for you, don't go try to hide. The world isn't big enough. Okay. There is no place on this earth, if God has a mission for you, if you have a destiny that you can hide from Almighty God. Okay. And, and again, I want to reiterate again at the, at the risk of, of repeating myself, Jonah was no coward. We like to say if something bad happens, well, we've got a Jonah with us. Jonah was no coward. He was a very brave soul willing to sacrifice himself. That also was a sign of Christ. Christ was willing to sacrifice himself if that cup of wrath even could be per changed to something different, that he sacrificed himself that we can have freedom. Well, Jonah is kind of doing the same thing. He's sacrificing himself, hoping the 10 tribes will live rather than being conquered by Nineveh, the capital of Syria. Verse four, listen carefully. But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea and there was a mighty tempest in the sea so that the ship was like to be broken. I mean, it was just hanging on from one second to the next. You can't get away from God. Okay. Don't, don't ever be foolish enough to even try that. Verse five, then the mariners were afraid. I mean, these were seasoned mariners, seasoned sailors, and cried every man unto his God. Notice this is lower case, not our God. And cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea to lighten it of them. I mean, they, they were about to sink, but Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship and he lay and was fast asleep. He didn't care. He, he was sacrificing himself. He, and he was doing it for the love of his people. But he was going against God's will. And that's the lesson and the sign that we learn from this is a little discipline that if God uses you, then don't try to turn away from it. Not wise at all. So he's, he's, I mean, he's at ease. He's happy with what he's doing. He's down there asleep and all heck is breaking loose around him. Verse six. And the shipmaster came to him and said unto him, what meanest thou, o sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God. Notice uppercase. El, our God. If so be that God will think upon us that we perish not. You know, they want a fair shake. You can't, I mean, they're, 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 they know that they're doomed if something doesn't happen here. Verse seven. And they said every one to his fellow, come and let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. So they cast lots and the lot fell upon Jonah. Boy, they've got a Jonah right in the middle of their little old vessel. And again, this is the, the old saying that'll come, well, well, that person is nothing but a Jonah. Well, they'd be quite a hero if that were the case, okay? Uh, God is in control. And there's not all that much truth to bad luck. Uh, bad luck is usually always bad management. That's why you want to step up to the plate and pre-plan and take responsibility for what you do, what you say, and what you act, okay? And then... Um, you won't have all that many disappointments in your life. But uh, here, the lot fell on Jonah. God let that be known. Hey, verse 8 to continue. Then said they unto him, Tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause this evil is upon us? What is thine occupation? Question. And whence comest thou, question? What is thy country, question? And of what people art thou? They want to know. And, and uh, they have a right to know. I mean, they know now or they feel pretty strongly 
that whatever is on this man is coming on them. Verse 9, And he said unto them, I am in Hebrew. That means from the word Eber. I, I'm one of those that crossed over the river. That's to say the, um, the uh, river that runs between Babylon and Israel. Okay, And uh, that's why they were called Hebrews, because they crossed the river. And I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which hath made the sea and the dry land. He that created all this, I'm a little afraid of it. Why? Because he crossed him. And he's beginning to get the idea that God is on his case. Verse 10. Then were the men exceedingly afraid and said unto him, what hast, Why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Why did you do this? Of course, you know, because it was to save his own people. Verse 11, Then said they unto him, What shall we do unto thee that the sea may be calm unto us? For the sea wrought and was tempestuous. Uh, I mean, it was bad. They ask him. You know, they're a pretty good bunch of old sailors here. They're giving him a break. Okay. You tell us what we can do to make this better. Verse 12, And he said unto them, Take me up and cast me forth into the sea. So shall the sea be calm unto you. For I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. I, I know it beyond any doubt. And certainly he had a right to. Again, I want to remind you, this is the only sign there's going to be. You want to really pay close attention. Verse 13, Nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring it to land. They did not want to dump him in the sea. They wanted to try to at least let him live and not have that on their conscience. They rode hard to bring it to the land, but they could not. For the sea wrought and was tempestuous against them just over and over and over. It was a terrible thing for them. 14. Wherefore they cried unto the Lord, and notice that's our God, not theirs, and said, We beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee, let us not perish for this man's life, for his sin, for whatever he's done wrong, and lay not upon us innocent blood. For thou, O Lord, has done as it pleased thee. In other words, we don't want to murder this man. We don't want to be responsible for his death. So um, we want you to look upon us, kind of tell us what to do. Verse 15, So they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea. And the sea ceased from her raging. I mean, just calmed right down. 16, then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord and made vows. Well, well, I mean, it's obvious to them. With that storm that was racking them, tearing their ship apart, and they were just hinging between life and death into that raging sea. And then when they do, as they prayed and cast the man over, it stops. So it's obvious the hand of Almighty God was upon them. Another sign. Verse 17, Now the Lord had prepared a great fish. I don't, I don't want you to read over that. A lot of people say, well, this was a whale. No, I, the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. And here we have a type of Christ, that um, as Christ would be in that tomb three days and three nights. It will be interesting to see what happens from here on, because this is the only sign you're going to get if you're looking for some kind of a sign, uh, other than current events and prophecy. But it makes it a very interesting chapter. I want you to know, a lot of people say, well, how could that be? This must be a fairy tale. No, 
the Lord prepared the fish. Okay, Many things are impossible for man. Nothing is impossible for Almighty God. Dove in the Hebrew tongue because of the coo and the warmth and always associated with the Holy Spirit. And um, uh, Jesus at one time would even call uh, Peter uh, son of Bar Jonah, okay, and uh, which is to say the son of Jonah, the son of the dove. And in Matthew chapter 12, verse 40, Christ told us, there's no, a wicked generation seeks for a sign. I'm just going to give you one. It's the sign of Jonah. So you need to understand the book of Jonah pretty well because there's a lot in it. Jonah has been ordered by God to go to Nineveh and preach to it, preach salvation. And, and uh, Jonah, knowing history, uh, Second Kings, that the Assyrians intend to take captive Israel, the ten tribes. And Jonah, rather than going there to help bring salvation, because they're about to go under. You know, the Assyrians are about to, they've had, they've had 18 years of hard luck, which is the t term of bondage. And in history, that's not an, an allegory or anything of that nature, that's history, okay? That at the time of this writing, that they had had this 18 years that were really bad. They were suffering. And God said, you go down and preach to them. And, and it was well, because this is the way that God took the 10 tribes as he had promised to scatter them and brought it to pass. But Jonah was cast into the sea by mariners because God had sent a tempest. God created two things to prove his point, the tempest and a great fish. Having created them for the very purpose, as you're going to hear Jonah's prayer of thanksgiving here in today's lecture. Uh, let, as a matter of fact, with, with no more being said, let's just get to it. Jonah's been cast overboard, and this fish took him in. This fish that was created especially by Almighty God for this purpose. Chapter 2, verse 1, the great book of Jonah. Word of wisdom from her father, and it reads, Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God, out of the fish's belly. So it's after the fact, and, and uh, he's there, he's alive. But it, uh, what, what was his prayer? You know, he never turned on God. He just disobeyed God because of the love of his people. Verse 2, and he said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. Out of the very grave itself, the word is suel in the Hebrew, which means grave. I was, he was already in the grave. I mean, considered dead. They cast him overboard. Verse 3, For thou hadst cast me into the deep in the midst of the seas. In, in the, uh, properly translated, really, it would say from the heart of the earth. Okay. And, and that, that's what salvation is about, was creating, that's what Mother Earth is about, in a way, is salvation. And the floods compassed me about, all thy, all thy billows and thy waves passed over me. I went under. I was a goner. Okay. And, uh, you know, I, it, this is a prayer after the fact, but um, he was willing to sacrifice himself for his people. This goes along with part of the sign of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, because he was the sacrifice, as it is written in Hebrews chapter 10, for one and all times. Don't you ever dare try to sacrifice some blood sacrifice again, as they did twice a day, the morning and evening oblation uh, at the altar of God, because his blood did away with all that. He was the sacrifice that would be for one and all times, the very son of the living God. And, um, and so it was bringing salvation to God's children. Those that would partake, that is to say. Jonah keeps praying. I mean, the waves went over me. I went down. Verse 4. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again 
toward thy holy temple. He knew in his heart and mind, regardless of what, there was afterlife. I mean, life after death, I should say, of the flesh, that he would be with the Father. And he felt that with the proper prayer and forgiveness, asking for forgiveness, that God would forgive him. Verse 5, the waters compassed me about even to the soul. That means my very uh, spiritual fl uh, um, body. The depth closed me round about. The weeds were wrapped about my head. And this is before God prepared the fish to take him in. He's, he's being washed in the current of the tempest. And the seaweed is wrapping around him. Uh, that's pretty bad straits. And it would be at this time that Almighty God provided a Savior for him. It was the whale and the, the great fish, I should say properly, and that God created for this specific purpose. And, and um, this would uh, get him from that particular predicament. Verse 6, I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. I was in the very valleys of the sea itself. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet hast thou brought me up, brought me up my life from corruption. That's to say from, from out, out of the grave, the pit. O oh Lord my God, you've saved me. And this is the sign that Jesus said, this is all you're going to have. And of course, there he was, as Jonah will be three days and three nights in this whale's belly. So Christ was in that same that grave of Mother Earth. And that's why it's important to properly translate it. Uh, so he was there and then resurrected to give us life, eternal life, being the sacrifice for one and all time. Seven, when my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer came in into, the, into thine holy temple. I know you heard me there, Father. Verse 8. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. Those that worship another god, that is to say that worship idols, that's, that's vanity, emptiness, is what, what is the Hebrew manuscripts. Those that worship idols of vanity lose their own mercy. That's, that's the love. And, and um, uh, unmerited favor. Okay. You, you lose that coming from Almighty God. And when you lose unmerited favor from Almighty God, you're in a heap of hurt, friend. Because He blesses us sometimes when we don't merit it. But when you are trying, even though you fall short, He will still bring in that unmerited favor, uh, Joel knows that um, he disobeyed God. So he needs a little unmerited favor. Okay? That's why he would bring this point in. Okay? Uh, you, you, he's, he must expect God to forgive him because he, he, did, he was wrong, that he disobeyed God a direct order okay, from our Heavenly Father. So, um, without unmerited favor, you're in a heap of hurt, friend. And, and the thing about unmerited favor and salvation is that it covers a lot of shortcomings. I suppose none of us are perfect, that we can't seem to get everything just right. But this is what covers over those loose ends that we can't quite get right. God does. And as long as you're in His favor, that stands. But if you worship something else or someone else, such as the false Christ, it all goes out the window, friend. Verse 9, But I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. That means I'm going, I'm going to give you my love, I'm going to have a change of heart, and I'm going to be thankful to you, Father. I will pay that that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. And um, here is that sign of salvation. This is the sign that Christ promised. Just as Christ himself was that great sign of salvation, that he paid that price on the cross of which this is the sign. And you want to sure pick up on it. 
that he paid that price uh, for you, you know. And you might think that this was a pitiful prayer by Jonah that he's, I mean, here he is in the deep. The tempest is wallowing him over. The sea would choking him, wrapping around him. He's finished. But God, God himself designed a great fish to bring this one through to set forth this example of how salvation would come into being from Almighty God. Okay. Verse 10, And the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. Uh, a lot of people think this was about Joppa. I don't. I think it was considerably north of Joppa because there were people, Ninevites there that observed it. Okay. They saw it happen. And in as much as uh, if, if you're not familiar with the Ninevites or the Assyrian, they worshiped a fish god. That, that was their god, was a fish god. And when this great fish came up on dry land and vomited out a living man, this is their god producing a savior. You got it? And I hope that in as much as God Almighty himself resurrected the Lord Jesus Christ and caused him to live and be with the people as it is written in Acts 1 for, for 40 days before he ascended back to the Father, a living being. The people of Nineveh, when they saw this, they knew it had to be from their God because the man was alive, right? vomited from the fish's belly. Now, now, I want you to note something else. It said here, the Lord spake unto the fish. So our father had programmed this great fish that he created to institute the real sign of salvation. What should I draw from that? God's in charge. That's why you want to pay strict attention to him. That's why you want to obey him. You see, he knows a great deal more about how he intends to work the plan of salvation than man does. Jonah kind of thought he could outsmart God by saving his people by destroying Nineveh. But you see, even Ninevites are God's children. And that's what sometimes people forget. And... Um, so we see here that, uh, in, in, in a sense, that and many might say, well, they worshiped a fish. Well, uh, so what? That's, that's bad well enough, but it was a sign. But then do you understand that in the Greek language, we took the same thing, or the, I won't even, the, that is the, uh, the, um, the symbol, uh, the um, cipher, is uh, Jesus Christ, um, Son of God, Savior? Okay, when you uh, when you spell fish out in the Greek tongue, the fish himself becomes a symbol of Christianity. I'm going to say that again. I, I did not say that the fish was Christianity. I said the fish became a sign of Christianity of salvation. And even today, you will see some Christians wear a fish and you wonder, well, why do they do it? Well, it's because of the cipher, okay? But at the same time, I cannot help tying in the fact that as it is written in Matthew chapter 12, verse 39 and 40, that this is the only sign you're going to get, okay? It's the sign of Jonah. Chapter 3, verse 1. I mean, here we have these Ninevites. They've witnessed this. And naturally, they're going to worship or believe what he says because they observed this. Verse three, chapter 3, verse 1. And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, You think he'll listen this time? I think so. You're going to see emotions of man. You're going to see Jonah angry and, uh, and so forth, and yet he's not going to disobey God. 
So God speaks to him a second time. Verse 2, Arise, you get up. Go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. I'll tell you what to say. In a sense, you could almost see the Holy Spirit, the Juna, speaking as it would on that great day when the tongue fell upon the people on Pentecost Day. And every language of the world, wasn't unknown, every language of the world understood it, God doing the preaching, just as the Holy Spirit will do the preaching in Mark chapter 13, verse 3. So Jonah arose, and he went into Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. He stayed with it this time. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. I want you to picture this a moment. Uh, three days journey, meaning it was um, it was about um, uh, twenty miles in in diameter. If you went straight across, but the circumference of this city would be sixty miles. So it's going to take a little doing to get around to preaching to this great city with the circumference of sixty miles. Okay, he, he's got his work cut out for him, but he has a good helper. He has Almighty God. Verse 4, And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Now, again, I, I want to remind you that history documents that there was 18 years that they were up against it. It was, it was serious, and serious enough that it's, it's noted in history for, for the Assyrians. And uh, when someone comes along and says um, uh, that um, 40 days, which is probation, and this man was regurgitated out of the belly of a fish, and he lives. He's walking, he's preaching, he's talking, and they're believing. Verse 5, so the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast, not a feast. They proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. I mean from the king all the way on down. They didn't stop there. It will even, even include animals, okay? Um, and... Um, and uh, they, they are believing that Jonah resurrected from the dead, meaning right out of the fish's belly, and he's in here preaching, and they believe in and worship a fish god. He's getting results. Okay. Verse 6, For a word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him, and covered him with sackcloth and set in ashes. I mean, he's, this, he's going all the way with this. Okay. Verse 7, listen to what he does. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything let them not feed nor drink water. Uh, now, um, God is seeing something here that he can't find in his own people. I mean, this, this is, talk about a fast. Talk about a day of mourning. Talk about a day of wanting to get right with Almighty God. Th this is a whole nation even down to the very animals themselves, they put sackcloth on the animals. A sign of mourning and weeping, sorrow, um, uh, praying to Almighty God. This impressed him. How could he help but be impressed? He couldn't get it from his own people, this type of loyalty, this type of faith. Verse 8. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn every one from his evil way 
and from the violence that is in their hands. Oh man. Now you're getting right. That Those are people after God's own heart. Okay. I mean, uh, this preaching is very effective. Do you know something, beloved? Uh, the preachings of Jesus Christ after the resurrection should be the same. You know, when he rose from the dead and walked the earth and preached to us, when he showed us the wonderful Holy Spirit and, and how that, um, that uh, the book of Joel chapter 2 would come to pass that both sons and daughters would speak the very truth just as these people are that from the king to the least in the kingdom and even the animals stop that that is evil get it out of this country and, and you can see the love of God in preparing them to conquer the ten tribes. Okay. I, I want you to see this because God would not send the Assyrian if he knew he was going to butcher all ten tribes. It's obvious there are people with heart. And they, that um, uh, God, in a sense, is pre preparing Jonah to prepare them to treat his people well through the captivity because these people have had it rough for 18 years, the number of bondage. And here, this man of God comes along, Jonah, the dove, cooing that warmth of truth and peace, and they absorbed it, touched their heart, and the whole nation bowed to Almighty God and asked God's forgiveness and blessings, okay? That's something God doesn't see in Israel or in Judah. Verse 9, who can tell if God will turn and repent, perhaps, and turn away from his furious anger that we perish not? Now, do you see in that um, the proclamation from the king of Nineveh and his uh, subordinates? Do you see the faith in that? It takes faith to reach God, okay? Faith is the key. And you see in that, he says, who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his furious anger and we perish not? He believed that God could do that. I mean, after all, they had seen a man resurrected from the dead right out of that fish's uh, regurgitation. And then again, I would remind, the only sign you're going to see is the earth give up the, the personage of the Lord Jesus Christ and he resurrected into life after death and preached to us. Why wasn't he received in that way? Why, you can better understand, the reason I'm doing this, I want you to see why it would be written in Matthew chapter 12, verses 39, 40, and 41. This is only a sign you're going to get. Is he was going to resurrect from the grave and you better listen to him. Verse 10, and God saw their works and they turned from their evil way and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. So we see here, you can better understand why Jonah would not want to free them because he knows still, this is the people that are going to take my people captive. And what have I done? I have through the word of God preached and now God has saved them. Verse 4. I'm sorry, chapter 4 and verse 1. Let's continue here. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. Now, here, well, what's he angry about? Because as far as he's concerned, he's a failure. God's certainly not a failure, but Jonah is. He, he, he was willing to sacrifice himself to die, but God raised him. And let that be a proof to you, God's in control. 
if, if God speaks to you, you know what? Do it. That is to say, if you understand and you are in good standing with him and you know it's not just a bad dream, that God has spared the Assyrians. He's ticked off. Verse 2, And he prayed to the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying? Isn't this what I said would happen? When I was yet in my country, question? Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish. For I knew that thou art a gracious God. I, I knew that you were merciful and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repentest thee of evil. Hey, those, those things are all true of the Father. But if the Father intends something be done, you're not going to get around it. Okay. There is no way that Jonah could have prevented uh, God interceding in his life to see that this type of Savior would come through him and it sets in motion the very sign that we have that the Lord Jesus Christ is the Savior of all God's children. In this case, even going as far as saving the Assyrian so that God could use whomever he would. Now, Jonah's being just, a, in my opinion, and this is only my opinion, Jonah's being a little bit impertinent here. I mean, he's crying out to God, and he's, he's complaining. I told you, God, it, this is how it was going to be. That's the way God wanted it. Don't ever forget that. This is what God wanted. God had received a blessing from these people at the preaching of Jonah. And it had accomplished its purpose. And no doubt in that remote sense, or I should say direct sense, uh, would bring a lot more comfort to the ten tribes when they were taken in bondage by these same people. Verse 3. Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. He's angry because of God's mercy and uh, not hardness? Uh, that would be a little bit on the impertinent side. Okay. He's kind of asking for it. But God, God loves Jonah. God has patience. I, I would not want to be in those shoes. But at the same time, Father is... I mean, he understood why... Jo he knew that Jonah was sacrificing himself for his children and, and um, setting the example of Savior. Otherwise, God might have taken a little different tack, okay? Verse 4, Then said the Lord, Doest thou well to be angry? Good for you, Jonah. You just, it just does you good just to be angry all you want to. Okay. Um, this is kind of said in irony. God is mocking him making fun of him, really, okay? Then it's good for you to be angry, okay? And, and uh, just, just put yourself in some sad sack and feel sorry for yourself, okay? Verse 5, So Jonah went out of the city, and he sat on the east side of the city, and there made him a booth, that's to say made him a little hut, and sat under it in the shadow till he, he might see what would become of the city. I mean, here, here's the enemy of his people. And he's spying on them. He just, he's, he's moody. He's angry. He's puffed up. He's impertinent to Almighty God. And he just, but, but watch what God does. Verse 6. And the Lord prepared a gourd. Here, here's another thing that God made on the behalf of Jonah. Okay. Prepared a gourd and made it to come up over Jonah, that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceedingly glad of the gourd. Um, and, and there you go. Um, 
it, it didn't think God prepared this, so it grew up overnight. I mean, it had big leaves, huge leaves, and it was it was so um, uh, the shadow gave protected him from the hot sun, and it was it was just wonderful. Okay, that he could. Uh, he was glad of the gourd, and um, you might say, if you're not careful, you could almost get in a flyaway mood here, huh? But what does God do? Seven. But God prepared a worm when the morning rose the next day, and it smote the gourd that it withered. Took it away just like that little old crimson worm. God's, God is kind of getting, he's taking care of business here. Eight, and it came to pass when the sun did arise that God prepared a vehement east wind and the sun beat upon the head of Jonah and he fainted and wished in himself to die and said, it is better for me to die than to live. Did um, Jonah thank God for the gourd? No, he didn't. He sure didn't. Jonah's getting a little bit forgetful after the beautiful Thanksgiving prayer he gave earlier. Nine, and God said to Jonah, Dost thou well to be angry for the gourd? And he said, I do well to be angry even unto death. Verse 10, Then said the Lord, Thou hast had pity on the gourd. He had pity for himself. For the which thou hast not labored, neither madest it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. I mean, there it was, um, reminding people of today, even if you would. Some people can really find religion and peace of mind, and it can just pop up there, and it can be so comforting, but God can snuff it away just that quick if he so desires. Okay. God's in control. That's what he wants you to know. He sent us the Savior. Verse 11 to complete the book. And should not I spare Nineveh, that great city wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand and also much cattle? God's judgment and love for his children you see, Abraham was to be a blessing to all people. That's what the word Father Abraham means. And well, why was he to be a blessing to many people? Because Christ would come through him. And Christ the Savior is a blessing to all people of the world, not just Israel, not just Judah, okay? but for all who would believe. God cares. God is kind. And God is merciful. But most of all, don't ever forget the sign that Jonah rose and preached. Christ resurrected from that tomb and he preached. And that's the type and sign you have. You know what? Anytime the grave gives a man up and he resurrects to heaven and sits at the right hand of God, only a fool would not listen to him. It might do you good to be angry and say there's no God if you choose. God will send you a gourd. He might even thump your gourd with a little red crimson worm. Looks like it draws blood, huh? Okay, it was even used for dye, this particular worm. So, you see, God brought us salvation. This is the only sign you're going to have as it is written in Matthew chapter 12, verses 39 and 40, that salvation is here. Do you want it? Then all you have to do is ask for it and believe in faith. All right, I hope you enjoyed.